or jot these down because your assignments, your assignment for this week is going to tie back into these learning outcomes. These are the walkaways, what you should know after the chapter one lecture. Your walkaway from the end of a lecture is that you should know all of the terms, the key terms that are listed on this slide here. And just think about some of these that you interface with. We go to meetings, uh, we're writing messages, uh, maybe we're sitting in teams. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple here that are even more important. And I would say uh, meetings are where a bulk of the work is done in business. So that second bullet point, attending meetings and participating in those meetings or running those meetings. Meetings are where a lot of stuff gets done because it's where you can get all the decision makers in one room and you can delegate out work and you can move decisions forward in a way that you can't do if you're trying to do that with, say, uh, written messages. Of course, there's new tools now like Zoom and Google Hangouts and all kinds of stuff to do meetings in a digital space as well. The third point, writing messages, a lot of business communication is still in written form. And folks who, you know, are uh, Gen X and older, um, they still like to use a lot of email. Just remember this. When you write a message at work, you are leaving a written record of your attention to detail. And you've probably had the experience of reading a message from your boss or somebody else at work, and it had a bunch of mistakes in it. And in that instance, it's kind of like having a conversation with somebody who's got food stuck in their teeth. You notice a problem, you're making negative judgments about the person, but you don't say anything. And at work, these types of mistakes with our written messages can really damage our image and ultimately really damage our career. So it's important to get it right when we actually take the time to sit down and do a written message. So we'll get to that later in the course when we start working on written messages. So in the ideal world, uh, the receiving party is going to understand your message and they have everything they need to execute. It's not vague, it's not unclear, it's in a positive tone. What prohibits that from happening? Interferences, factors that hinder communication. So we can think about that. It could be you're distracted or somebody else is on their phone or the timing's bad uh, or you're trying to hold a meeting right after lunch and everybody's tired. So think about all the different interferences that you face at work and how do you manage those? How do you manage those interferences? How are you able to stay focused and not have those interferences get in the way? That can be even other people just soaking up your time. So this might be one of your discussion questions for Canvas this week. Think about that question. And other factors that obviously uh, get in the way of good communication, if somebody has extreme different levels in education, uh, or experience with a particular job, you might be talking at a level that they just don't understand. There's going to be cultural differences, uh, language barriers, physical issues, noise, room temperatures, and a ton of mental distractions. So all of these interferences kind of have to be negated before you can sit down and have clear communication with somebody. And that's why the best way to communicate in business, the one that is the most media rich, where you have a lot of ways of, of getting to somebody, is face to face. You have eye contact, you have vocal variety, you have gestures, you have all of these things available that you don't have when you start using other channels like text messages or email. So face to face is the most media rich because it has the most tools and it's less likely that the recipient is going to be distracted. Formal is typically uh, follows the organizational chart of the company. So it's you communicating, communicating to your boss and then your boss communicating to her boss and her boss communicating to her boss, etc. 
right? So this typically follows the organizational chart of the company, where say, for example, you're a brand new um, employee, a coordinator of the paperclip division. Uh, you probably wouldn't send a business proposal directly to the CEO of the company, right? Uh, that would be circumventing the formal communication network. You're going to send your, your business idea to your boss, and they're going to send it to their boss, etc. So you want to be clear about what is the network in which I'm communicating, who am I supposed to communicate with, and who am I not. So, <clears throat> And this can get dicey, because sometimes there's a political environment that isn't clearly outlined. So you want to understand that piece. Now, there's a second network, and that's the informal network, a.k.a. the grapevine which we hear like, oh, the grapevine, I heard it through the grapevine. That's um, that's like gossip, right? Like office gossip and who's getting promoted and who's going to get a new office, that kind of stuff. So the grapevine, informal communication network, is partly that, but it's also a valuable communication tool for managers. Just as a side example, look at how President Trump uses the Twitter, an informal communication network that's not directly tied to the White House and Congress and the Senate, that he communicates directly kind of with his constituents, his followers, uh, through that grapevine Twitter feed and gets uh, kind of lobbies for things through that network. You can do the same thing as a manager. If you're getting ready to launch a new initiative, um, you may, before you actually formally communicate it with a meeting and a memo and all these kind of things. If you think there's going to be some potential problems, you might want to use the grapevine first and maybe float that idea out informally to a couple folks who are uh, uh, key communicators in a department. Maybe we would say they're gossipy or blabbermouths and see what happens as that information gets floated out. So managers can use the grapevine, the informal communication network, to send out information, and then they also have a pulse on what's uh, what's coming down the line. So a lot of the information on the grapevine in business is actually business-related, about 75%. We think it's just gossip, but actually most of it is business-related. So that's a question for you that could show up on your assignment. How can you use the grapevine to your advantage at work? if you're a manager or whatever, so how can that play to your favor? And then communication, formal and informal, it also flows up and down. And here you see an embedded video up top from the great movie Office Space, just a short little funny video. If you can't open it here in this slide, you should be able to roll over it and uh, that'll activate the YouTube link by clicking on it. But if that doesn't work for you, You can go back into the week one module in Canvas and you'll see uh, video resources under the week one and you can scroll down and find that video and watch that. So, um, But, you know, communication flows up and it flows down and it flows horizontally. So how you communicate to your boss, what we call managing up, is different than how you communicate to your direct reports, your subordinates managing down. You might be really nice to your boss and really mean to your employees so that's the difference between upward and downward communication. And then also how you communicate to your peers. So <clears throat> one thing that happens in work a lot, especially large organizations, is this concept of redundant communication. And you'll see this in the video that's up top, where um, you get the same information from four different people. You might get it in a meeting and in a memo and in a video. And that's just a waste of everybody's time. So that's another question for you here in addition to the one above it, is what ideas do you have for reducing redundant communication at work? So here's some more detail on different levels of communication. And a key piece here is intrapersonal versus interpersonal. Intrapersonal is how you communicate within, within yourself. So this is your own inner monologue, if you will. So interpersonal, which is most of the communication we focus on in this class, is you communicating to other folks, you know, with written or verbal communication. So groups and communicating in groups is very different than one-on-one -on -one communication. You have group dynamics, and we'll get to that later in this lecture. 
then how you communicate out to the public, uh, your public persona, if you will, is very important. You know, there's been a lot of uh, examples lately of folks not getting hired or even getting fired because of content that's posted on their social media sites. So you want to be really careful, particularly if you're interviewing for a new job, or be careful of who you're friends with at work, uh, because that information is now essentially public, and employers can look at it. Why? Because you put it out there on the internet. So really think twice about your social media content, because it is available for public consumption. At work, unethical behavior does happen. Why? Because there's money involved. There's money involved and there's competitive work environments, and that can lead to people doing shady stuff, shady stuff to try to move up the ladder. So we want to keep it in the lines. You should be very careful and aware of what are the company guidelines, uh, particularly with use of email and things like office relationships. So oftentimes, as a new hire, we sign a bunch of papers. We may not read all of it. We're so ecstatic that we just got a new job that we may not read through all this stuff. But in those documents, human resources might have language around there to the effect of don't use company email for personal correspondence. And that kind of stuff can kind of bite you in the butt. So we'll talk more about uh, these pieces in a few. We're looking at the second learning outcome. So one of the concepts around this is this concept of ethnocentrism. And ethnocentrism is simply a country judging other countries and uh, other foreigners, if you will, by their country's norms, like say if I was an American, I would be judging other countries by how we do it in America, and judging those other countries as inferior by comparison. For example, here in the US, uh, we are a low context culture, we value contracts, we assume that people show up for work on time, we assume that when we show up for a meeting, we're going to start talking about the meeting topics and not spend a bunch of time socializing. So that's all kind of US ethnocentrism. So ethno, ethnic centrism, being centered on your own ethnic standards or cultural standards, is judging other cultures by your own norms. It's not necessarily bigotry, it's, it's more of a nationalist way of doing things. Um, judging other countries by your standard and deeming them inferior by comparison. Luckily for us, being Americans, and capitalists, much of the globe has now adopted our capitalist ideals with contracts and work ethic and hours. But in other countries, things are still different. So, um, Body language, one of your bullet points on this slide, uh, is a real thing. In some countries, people talk much closer to each other, and in other countries, people are more further apart. You, know, you might be in Japan where they stand at a distance where they can bow and their heads won't hit each other. So you might be in some Latin countries where people get really close and the men are like kissing other men on the cheek or things like that. And so uh, it's very different. And here we're getting the issues of proxemics and you know how much time do we spend on things, like the when do we start the meeting I was telling you about, chronometrics, chronometrics. So all these things can lead to us having judgments about different countries, and that's where we get into ethnocentrism. It also creates a lot of barriers to intercultural communication. So if you have somebody who's from a different country, maybe it's in a team, you want to ask them what's different about how you do things there, and not just assume, that would be ethnocentrism, not just assume that they do it the way that you do. So the other big piece here is social media, and I have a video up top uh, with Mark Zuckerberg testifying in Congress, and this is quite recent. And I think we're going to see a lot of legislation coming down the line for social media networks. That's certainly in the works because they have operated mostly unregulated for many years. You know, I think in 2017, out of the uh, 
$200 billion that was made in digital advertising. About half of that was between Facebook and Google. So um, these are really large companies, and they've been operated mostly unregulated for quite some time. So social media also has infected or, or certainly impacted how we communicate at work. You know, now our emails might have LOL um, at the end of it. Uh, which is a text message thing, right? And um, so there's a blurring between what's work and what's social media and what parts of social media do we use at work. And so it's an opportunity to create new Facebook groups and ways for businesses to communicate with Twitter feeds and YouTube channels and Facebook Live conferences. So it's all out there. And um, it's still largely unregulated. So that's my caveat here with the social media piece. I know we all use it. And I'm just as addicted to them as you are. Here's my phone. Um, <clears throat> but it's going to be changing. And there's legislation definitely coming down. And then uh, in, addition, in addition to diversity and technology uh, teams, and the need to be able to function and interact in a team environment is paramount uh, in business today. So synergy is the concept that two heads are better than one and four heads are better than two. So if we can bring people together, each with distinct skills, and put them on a team, they can get something done a lot faster than if we have a big organization and we're trying to move things through this large organization department by depart department. So we certainly see this in the Silicon Valley set. So it's kind of self-managed teams, giving employees a lot of autonomy. And the bottom line is this, at work, uh, as you get out of college and start advancing your career, you're gonna spend a lot of time working in teams. So learning how to do that is essential. We'll be talking about this more. Teams aren't always fun, however, right? So um, you probably have had some teams uh, in other classes uh, or other projects you've done in school, and oftentimes students say, you know, I'd rather stick hot needles in my eyes than work on a team project. So, because somebody contributes more, or it's tough to get people together, or people aren't contributing at all, uh, you end up doing all the work. These are all fears about um, a team environment. But when it's done well, and when you can harness everybody's strengths, teams are awesome. Teams are a wonderful way uh, to move things forward in a way that you can't do. Um, just working independently. So how do you do that? How do you have a successful participation in a team environment? So you have to have open communication, number one. So give feedback, take feedback. Um, you have to have team functioning. It doesn't happen right away. There's some stages that you go through. Uh, you need each person to contribute in a way that best harnesses their skills, and somebody has to run the team, right? So that's another piece of this. Now, one of the things uh, with teams and groups is that there are stages, stages of group formation. And you'll see in stage two there, it shows uh, storming. So storming is one of the actual stages of a group. So in stage one, you're kind of forming, you're getting together, uh, you're all strangers at this point, and then you start trying to tackle the project at hand. So, and here you're starting to formally kind of discuss maybe some different roles or how you want to tackle the project. And that leads to some conflict, what we call storming. So, um, Nobody wants to be like controlled or you're going to be the leader. Well, maybe I should be the leader, right? And maybe we should do the project this way and not that way. So the storming is actually a healthy and necessary part of team formation. And then what comes out of that, ideally, through the storming piece, is you get into some norming. So uh, we can accept each other's viewpoints. Everybody's got something to say here. Uh, roles are starting to be established. And then you get into the performing stage where everybody's got a clear role and everybody's doing their piece. So in the hierarchy of the actual team is no longer of key importance. So
because everybody's contributing equally. So there really is no, quote, one leader. A popular form of teams today at work is cross-functional self-managed teams. Which is a fancy term for kind of a mini version of the company itself. When I was a product manager at Jack in the Box, I led teams of people with the responsibility of launching new products at work. And on those product teams, we would have somebody from purchasing and marketing and operations and distribution and finance, um, the research and development R&D uh, kitchen area. And collectively, our team was basically represented all the different divisions of the company. And that's where the term cross-function comes into play. Cross-function meaning folks from different departments, function, functional departments, a mini version of the company itself. And what that enables is that those people on the team who represent their functional departments can make decisions on behalf of their department versus one individual person who's trying to move an initiative through all those different departments is very time consuming. So cross-functional team and then self-manage means they manage themselves. So they don't have to report to a whole bunch of different bosses and that speeds up their decision making process. So companies are trying to reduce their layers of management, one, because it's less expensive and two, because by empowering employees, they can manage themselves, and if we do it properly and incentivize them, then we can make decisions faster and get more nimble in the marketplace. One of the ways that companies execute cross-functional self-managed teams, they don't necessarily go together. Cross-functional self-managed teams and matrix organizations can be two separate things. Is But one way that they execute cross-functional self-managed teams is through a matrix organizational structure. This is what I had at Jack in the Box. At Jack in the Box, we had a matrix structure. And a matrix structure basically is this. Say I work in purchasing, and I'm a purchasing manager, and I'm responsible for buying all of the animal proteins for this company. And I report to the director of purchasing. I'm a manager, I'm a purchasing manager and I report to the director of purchasing. But as a purchasing manager who purchases all the animal proteins for the company, we're pretending like it's Jack in the Box, I also sit on three different product teams. And those product teams are working on launching new products. And those new products uh, need things from purchasing, like, hey, we're looking at buying uh, this new type of uh, chicken nugget or we're looking at buying this new type of sirloin for use in a new product. So as a purchasing manager, I can represent the purchasing department on that team. That team is led by a product manager, somebody who's responsible for managing that team and getting the product launched. So the question is this, if I'm a purchasing manager, who's my boss? Is it the director of purchasing or is it the, the product managers on the teams that I sit on? And the answer in a matrix organization is it's both. So both of those people are your manager. And you can see how this can get complicated when you have a matrix organization structure. You have what's called dotted line reporting. You report to one person with a dotted line to somebody else. And that's what's shown in this slide here. Typically, your primary reporting is still to the person, uh, the director of the department you are in, but then also a dotted line to the product manager. And matrix organizations, typically, you're on that team for a specific length of time until that product is launched, and then you go and you sit on other teams. Whereas a cross-functional self-managed team could be a permanent team structure. Okay, so that's your key terms out of chapter one. So um, in reviewing your learning outcomes for chapter one, 
you want to answer these two things. First off, your first key learning outcome is be able to explain how information flows in an organization. And we talked about up and down and sideways and how it can be written. And, you know, so there's a lot of ways information flows. It can be formal, it can be informal. And you see some of the questions related to this learning outcome listed below here. And these are all fair game for your week one, chapter one assignment. The second learning outcome, be able to identify communication challenges with regards to diversity, technology, teams, and other factors impacting communication. So here you see questions around diversity challenges, technology challenges, and team challenges. So these questions could also be fair game for your week one assignment. So take some time if you haven't already and think about each of these questions for the first learning outcome as well as the second learning outcome. Jot down some notes and have those notes uh, in front of you before you actually dive into the week one homework.